I always think back to my high school choir director because he was the first guy who really pushed me to do singing, to sing more. He was the first person who really started giving me uh, the opportunity to experience opera. He would give me some CDs, you know, back when those were a thing. Uh, he would he would really he'd suggest music. There's these set of John Jacob Nile songs that I still sing that I actually probably I'm gonna bring out pretty soon that he introduced me to. And, and, and the biggest thing that I always kept from him was, I mean, it's a simple phrase, like, you, you know, you get what you put into something. And it sort of really resonated with me in terms of art and that sort of, you know, education work, because we often, what I found is we often think that, oh, I want to be an artist because I don't want a nine to five job, or I don't want that routine schedule. But, you know, the hours of work still have to go in. They may not sit in the nine to five, five days a week section, but they, there are countless hours spent in the practice room. There are countless hours prepping for performances and learning how to teach, teaching, actually spending hours doing all of that and just, you know, putting yourself in that position. And it really, um, that was the biggest, I don't know, that was just the biggest help. I mean, he was also one of the greatest musicians I ever worked with. And, you know, he was a high school choir director. So that's, I mean, that's the, the other coolest part that um, art and artistry are not limited to the greatest of us, right? Or the greatest of us, the most successful, quote unquote, but that, you know, every person that you touch with your art can really grow into something that you wouldn't even imagine. I, I don't know. It was just the coolest thing to see how much influence he had over so many different lives and especially mine. You know, I, it's, it's just funny. <laughs> it's, just, it's crazy thinking about it. Yeah. I was actually just chatting with someone um, this week about our high school choir director and how big of an influence she was on us. And it's, it's pretty an amazing time in your life, right? Like yeah. high school and college, those are formative. It's fantastic. Yeah. And here we are teaching college and it, you have to keep that in mind, right? Don't yeah. screw them up. I know. Be the reason <laughs> someone stops doing what they love. <laughs> yeah. What sort of voice work does your job require of you? So if you were going to describe your job to someone who's never seen an opera, what what is your job? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, performing wise, we're, we're going back. You know, to I always I used to say uh, I get to scream at people with makeup on uh, for money, but like, you know, the more I think about it and the more I started studying and the more I've sort of put that sort of time into it. I think I think it's more like I get to project at people while I'm wearing makeup instead of scream. Now, granted, there are some screaming moments for sure that are definitely, I would say, kind of necessary in a lot of operas or in musicals. I think there's moments where that sort of emotional intensity is like a really important part of the storytelling. Um, but, you know, in general, I... Uh, for, for classical and opera, operatic singing, let's start with opera, I really am just trying to maximize my available resonance. You know, I'm just using all the fun words, but basically trying to make sure that I can be heard over an orchestra of, let's say, at least, of, of more than, of less than 70. <laughs> you know, we get too many people in a room. I, you know, it doesn't matter how many, uh, you know, I'm going to always lose to like three trombones. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, basically I get to dance and play around and do all that sort of stuff. I mean, I'm currently right now, I'm right now I'm currently covering a role remotely uh, just in case something happens for Virginia Opera in case they're doing three Decembers and it's a role I sang six years ago. Oh, and um, you know, and so it's been a lot of just like making yourself available, I would say. I'd say I would say for performing availability and reliability are actually more important than talent at some points because um you know in general in the professional realm like, there are a lot of really great singers there are a lot of awesome fabulous singers and um a few a few less fabulous actors in opera i would say but in general um there there are people about that are around but you know the way to sustainably have a performance career is to make yourself known that you are available to work you are reliable, you will come, you will have everything ready. They don't have to worry about spending extra resources on you. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that like, you're gonna be like completely learned every time you jump in, right? I mean, but it does mean that they know that when push comes to shove, you are gonna be ready to perform. Um, 
I often I often say, think that you know you know what is it preparation when preparation meets luck or something uh, that's the successful luck I, equals preparation plus opportunity. Ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, um, and I think you know I, that's a really great way to put it because you know all of these things that you do you have to make sure that you are always prepared and that when you have the opportunity again that you don't allow things to get in the way that could stop you from being successful and i mean that's different for everyone right different everyone has different neuroses different learning curves and whatnot but i think it's really important to know know thine self know what you need if you need a coach for french get a coach for french it doesn't matter if it's more money you have to do it in order to be at a certain level if you can handle everything yourself but it takes you an extra week basically make that time to handle it or have someone help you you know i think very often we feel like we can't that we can't do things um without a certain routine and i think very often every situation is different but you know having a team of people that you can trust a voice teacher a coach um you know uh, a director uh can really help you get a better grasp of what you have to do, especially in opera, which has such distinct, older, uh, somewhat antiquated traditions, I would say. I mean, a lot of newer operas are not necessarily in that realm anymore, but I would say in general, you know, if you're going to sing La Cenerentola, you're going to sing it the same way that they've been singing it for a long time, because that's how it, in a way, that's how it's best approached. That's how it's best experienced for the audience, right? Um, and so it's been really interesting, you know, uh, so working on, you know, for instance, Silvio right now, which is a reasonable opera, and then also re going over Three Decembers, which are b both baritone roles, though Three Decembers is uh, basically like very tenor. It is so high. And <laughs> and um, and Silvio is, the, you know, the, the more luxuriated, uh, love, love struck uh, baritone in that show. And so it's an interesting way to look at it, because, you know, we think of classical, we think of opera. You know, old school people think of the horns, we think of loud, right? We think of like this sort of yelling sort of sensation. And um, a lot of operas nowadays don't require the same sort of uh, projected um, lack of nuance, I'd say, lack of nuance. And now, you know, a lot of these newer chamber operas, you can really sing in a way that is very expressive, almost in a sort of heightened art song level at points still obviously giving way to some big projected moments but you know not everything is verity and what i've started noticing is that the people who sing new opera like verity are losing audiences to my at least in my uh, attention span because i'm losing sort of the nuance of what makes these new chamber stories so interesting so i i went on my own tangent during that and uh but i would say in general like you know making sure that i can sing every day is the biggest part of my job in terms of performing like i should be able to sing every day not that i can't get sick but i would prefer not to get sick <laughs> yeah absolutely but i love what you were saying about the way opera has kind of changed because that mirrors the way musical theater has changed right no because you know with anything else in life if you need help with something you should go to the doctor you should ask for help but for some reason with the voice we feel this I mean, there's an intimacy with the voice there's a personal there's a personal attachment to it that very often feels like we are um, less lesser if there's something wrong. And I just I think it's really important to realize that a lot of things have nothing to do with anything other than the situational circumstance. You could be sick. You could cough really hard one day. You could be working out in the yard and be dehydrated and then someone comes in or you get scared and you there's some voice in your I mean, there's so many things that can happen because when it comes down to it, they're just little flaps of skin muscle tissues, that bulbous fluid stuff. And, uh, you know, and as a result, you have no real control over exactly how much to do. Right. And so to me, to me, it's really important to know your voice. If you're taking voice lessons, you're going to be more aware of your voice. That's the whole I mean, that's a big that's a big bonus of voice lessons. Right. Not that you're going to sing better. You're going to have better perception of what is happening. And if there's a problem and, you know, really trust in the fact that there are people out there that have spent years and years of their lives figuring out best practices to rehabilitate your voice or to habilitate your voice as well. Like there's lots of different things you can do as a living human 
to make sure that you never experience that sort of trauma. But know that, I mean, if it's if it happens, it happens and you will be helped through it. You know, long gone are the days of, you know, where they're going to do some crackpot surgery on Julie Andrews vocal folds. You know, we got like robots, we got lasers, we got all sorts of stuff. And like the, the science has really caught up in a lot of ways, the other aspects of, of the job. And I talk about that in pedagogy a lot. You know, just 10 years ago, it would be a really different world trying to get uh, vocal help. Like we didn't have the tools, we didn't have the knowledge. And like now, because of the nature of technology being cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, we have the ability now to adjust. And I think never, ne never be afraid to ask for help. You know, this is with everything, preparation, with your voice, with just anything. Never be afraid to ask for help and go to people who have spent far more time than you will ever spend, like figuring out how to make sure that these things don't go awry. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, in general, I, you know, I, I've known so many people that have had hemorrhages, that have had nodules, that have had uh, lesions of some form, and you know they went on therapy or they had surgery in some cases and they came back good as new i mean they're they're it is scary i mean uh, i still don't i i mean i'm not i still don't want to get lasik because someone says laser in your eye and it just for some reason my brain my body starts to raise my blood pressure but like you know knowing and seeing these people and talking to them and that experience and i mean i know it's lasik safe not to go on a lasik tangent but um knowing that there are you know peer reviewed there's curated techniques there's all these things that are happening now just there's no reason to suffer by yourself there's no reason to try to be a hero for your voice like there are so many like, everything that you know it takes a village that includes voice training it takes a village in everything and it's really important that you don't you don't limit yourself by saying i'm broken right because you know none of us are perfect and we all need help and the best the best case for our help is that we go to the people that have spent the most time figuring out how to do it